No, Mr. Briquette. I have not forgotten. I was thinking that you seem to have forgotten the phrase separation of church and state, but the one thing I did forget was just how divisive and dishonest and distasteful someone like you can be. I've sat here today and listened to you pander to these people, but you don't actually care about them, or you wouldn't be sitting here reinforcing their ignorance and prejudices. You heard that, caller. She just called you ignorant and prejudiced. I do not think everyone in America is ignorant. Far from it. But we are today probably the most uneducated, underread, and illiterate nation in the Western Hemisphere, which makes it all the more puzzling to me why the biggest question on your small mind is whether or not little Johnny is going to recite the Pledge of Allegiance every morning. I'll tell you something else, Mr. Briquette. I have had it up to here with you and your phony issues and your Yankee doodle yakking. I am sick and tired of being made to feel that if I am not a member of a little family with 2.4 children who goes just to Jerry Falwell's church and puts their hands over their hearts every morning, that I am unreligious, unpatriotic, and un-American because I have news for you, Mr. Briquette. All liberals are not kooks any more than all conservatives are fascists. And the last time I checked, God was neither a Democrat nor a Republican. And just for your information, yes, I am a liberal, but I am also a Christian. And I get down on my knees and pray every day on my own turf, on my own time. And one of the things that I pray for, Mr. Briquette, is that people with power will get good sense. And people with good sense will get power. And that the rest of us will be blessed with the patience and the strength to survive the people like you in the meantime. I'm Karina Monoran, and welcome to Her Salty Words. Welcome back to part two of my interview with Zoe Kelly. If you haven't watched part one, check it out on my YouTube channel, Why You Gotta Be So Salty, or type Her Salty Words, and salty is spelled S-A-L-T-I, words, into the search bar of your podcast platform. There you will find all the episodes for this podcast. And while you're there, click subscribe and give five-star ratings so that I can hopefully one day turn this from a one-woman solo podcast to a whole bunch more humans. Let's introduce Zoe Kelly again. Zoe is an actress, producer, director, teacher. She's on a mission to find ways to serve the community by sharing knowledge she's gained and experiences she's had. She seeks ways to inspire and support the women around her and provides space so that those who are underrepresented have a platform such as women of color, LGBTQI+, etc. Now, I do want to give a trigger warning for part two of this episode. We will be talking about sexual assault, violence, addiction, abortion, and the like. If any of these result in a trigger, please take a moment to self-care. To ensure you are not surprised when it happens within the episode, I'm going to give a heads up with this sound effect. This will play before and after the parts of the discussion occur. If you need additional support or are seeking additional information regarding any of the information that we give or discuss, please go to RAIN.org, R-A-I-N-N.org, or call 800-656-4673. And please, please make sure to take care of self first. This episode will be waiting for you when you are ready and able. Before we return to the interview with Zoe, I'd like to touch base on some important laws that are passing and are being overturned in Idaho and the country regarding reproductive rights and the woman's right to choose. On March 14th of this year, Idaho passed a veto-proof Fetal Heartbeat Preborn Child Protection Act, which bans abortion after six weeks and allows the father, sibling, grandparent, aunt, uncle of the fetus to bring legal action against the medical professional who performed the abortion. Here's a clip where legislators are discussing this. I understand that, that a, uh, someone who has committed a rape would not be able to uh, sue if an abortion were to take place. 
would a family member of said rapist be able to sue? Would they have standing? Down from 21. Thank you. If it is the uh, parents, siblings, aunts and uncles, grandparents, then yes. Uh, same question then uh, for incest as well? Down from 21. Thank you. Yes. So if I am raped and choose to have an abortion and my rapist has 10 siblings, is there anything to preclude all of them and their spouses from um, bringing a lawsuit for $20,000 each? Down from 21. I'm not sure their spouses are included in, the, in that list, but uh, no. Idaho is the first state to essentially mirror the fetal heartbeat law that Texas put into effect last September. In the Texas law, anyone in the United States can bring legal action against anyone who helped a pregnant woman get an abortion. Under the Idaho law, though, a doctor is not allowed to perform an abortion on a pregnant woman when a fetal heartbeat has been detected, except in the case of a medical emergency, rape, or incest. Planned Parenthood said in a statement, Idaho's anti-abortion lawmakers ignored public opinion and rushed through this legislation, looking to capitalize on the U.S. Supreme Court's failure to block Texas's ban. They added, the bill's sponsors and supporters have even explicitly stated their desire for Idaho to be the next Texas. Now, something to note about these laws. Majority of the lawmakers pushing this through are men, and mostly white men. Texas's near-abortion ban gives any citizen $10,000 to sue anyone seeking an abortion. And in Idaho, not wanting to be outdone, one-upped Texas and offers $20,000 to the family members of the man who impregnates the woman, should the woman seek an abortion. This means that if the man has three brothers, 12 sisters, a mom, a stepmom, stepdad, grandfather, grandmother, in-laws, they could potentially each sue the woman seeking an abortion as well as the health care provider who performs the abortion up to four years after the abortion was performed. Four years! Although the Idaho law includes an exception for medical emergencies for pregnancies that occur through rape or incest, the exception only applies if there is documentation such as a police report. This is concerning because of how rape is already processed, addressed, the backlog of rape kits, how the system is designed to side with the rapist, the lack of urgency or concern from law enforcement in finding the perpetrator. But please, let's make sure that should a rapist be found not guilty, let them have the right to sue the woman whom they assaulted and collect $20,000. Let's talk about that six-week heartbeat that is surrounded by an underdeveloped ecosystem of nerve endings and cells en route to a not yet for many more weeks viable baby that may or may not be able to live once it exits the placenta. Sarah Horvath, an OBGYN with the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists states, Detecting a fetal heartbeat can be a sign that there is a pregnancy developing, and that's a sign we use to reassure people. Jennifer Kearns, who's an OBGYN at UC San Francisco and Director of Research in Obstetrics and Gynecology at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, asserts, At six weeks, the embryo is forming what will eventually develop into mature systems. There is an immature neurological system and there's a very immature cardiovascular system. She addresses the specific six-week abortion ban. She states, it's a group of cells with electrical activity. That's what the heartbeat is at that stage of gestation. We are in no way talking about any kind of cardiovascular system. In 1984, when technology was barely in its gestational period of tracking the development of an embryo, Researchers were excited to pick up fetal cardiac activity at between 41 and 43 days of gestation. That's six weeks. They described it as a tiny blinking, flashing, and or rocking echo with a regular rhythm. Jennifer Horvath explains, what's really happening at that point is that our ultrasound technology had gotten good enough to be able to detect electrical activity in a rudimentary group of cells. 1984. Think about that. In 1984, we barely had the technology to hear a heartbeat, and the lawmakers want to give a group of cells personhood 
and rights of a living person based on a tiny blinking flashing and a rocking echo with a regular rhythm that Janet Rosent, a senior scientist and chief of research emeritus at the Hospital for Six Sick Children in Toronto describes, is just helping to encourage the development of an organized vascular and circulatory system, a prerequisite for future viability, but not sufficient alone. But hey, what do the experts know about the development of a baby? We have lawmakers, and by lawmakers, I mean the GOP, who are not doctors or scientists, who are going to lead us on this righteous path to God's will. Not only will they force a woman to carry a baby to term, they will criminalize the abortions. Check out this clip. This is a homicide statute. What this bill does is to specifically amend the crime of homicide and the crime of criminal battery to enable the state to charge people, including the pregnant person, the pregnant mother, at any stage of gestation from the moment of fertilization without the need for implantation. Yeah. Without the need for implantation. So a group of cells that cannot yet take a breath on its own suck on a mother's breast, piss in a diaper, is more protected than the life of a woman. And I'm not saying this to be crass or devalue a potential baby. I'm saying this because a group of cells is not yet a baby, and making the potential of viability more valuable and important than an actual life, that is a contributing member of society, makes no sense. If the mother dies, who will take care of the baby? Adoption, you say? Yes. Let's traumatize this possible human more by putting it into a system that essentially human traffics children in plain sight. The father? Yeah. Because we have an excellent record of how fathers show up. And for the fathers that do, studies show that because they receive higher pay, they will inherently be more successful in raising children as a single parent than a mother. This is also because men are praised for taking on the responsibility of taking care of children, thus receiving additional support and understanding compared to mothers. What would it look like if the mother received the same support and economic opportunity? Because let's be clear, the purpose of these laws is not to ensure life at conception. It's to ensure control over a woman's body. If the GOP truly cared about life, then every pregnant woman would receive universal health care for pre- and postnatal care, fully paid family leave, free child care, and the opportunity to return to work at full pay. Same position without bias, and more importantly, have equal pay for equal work to that of her male counterpart. Let's also be really clear about the ultimate goal for the GOP in these abortion ban laws that are popping up like a mattress firm outlet on every street corner. They want to overturn Roe v. Wade. And based on the recent leak, it worked. On May 2nd, just a few days ago, Political published the draft. The Supreme Court has voted to strike down the landmark Roe v. Wade decision, according to an initial draft majority opinion written by Justice Samuel Alito. If and when abortion is banned, it will open the floodgates to overturn rights that women, people of color, LGBTQI, transgender, and all marginalized communities, etc., have. The right to contraception. This is what we said. This is what we fucking said. The ruling isn't even official yet, and Idaho's like, can we get rid of birth control now? It will criminalize the act as a homicide. Louisiana's new House Bill 813 would make any abortion after fertilization equivalent to homicide. Louisiana House Bill 813, called the Fetal Personhood Bill, made it out of the Republican Committee 7-2 to two last night. It would make abortion a crime of homicide from the moment of fertilization. And if you were wondering, Louisiana still enforces capital punishment for homicide. Critics rightly point out that this would also criminalize in vitro fertilization and perhaps some form of birth control. Moreover, House Bill 813 makes no exception for minors, for rape, for incest, or for ectopic pregnancy. By banning contraception, it will put the woman in a position to seek a back alley abortion, which will then put her in the line of fire to be criminalized and sued, not to mention her life at risk for infection and or possible death. But what would it matter? 
She would die anyway if she was criminalized with a death penalty. Once criminalized, the woman would lose her right to vote, leaving voting rights to a male majority. But why wait for a woman to be criminalized to take away her voting rights? Eric Erickson tweeted after the draft was leaked, My big issue with Roe has always been that abortion shouldn't be a constitutional right, but left to each state under federalism. But given the hysterics and hysteronics coming out of Dobbs, I'm starting to think we need to repeal the 19th Amendment. Eric is not misogynistic at all. Here's another conservative talking about taking away people's rights. I just, I have to double down on this. You know, they care so much about everybody voting in democracy. And it's like, if you went back to the founding and the founding fathers would have said something to the effect of like, yeah, women and probably feminine men shouldn't be allowed to vote because then their chaotic nature would manifest throughout society. And you would would say, well, no, that's not right. That's mean. You're probably an incel. And then the founding father would just say, oh, well, do you have any evidence from your time that would contradict this? And you'd just be like... No, not exactly, not exactly. So it would seem that they were actually right. Because, I mean, let's be real. Menstruating women who create and birth humans are too hysterical and emotional to properly know how to vote accordingly. But we are good enough to shove dicks in our vaginas and get pregnant. Wait. We can't even do that right. Because when an unwanted pregnancy occurs after a man ejaculates his orgasm into the woman's uterus... She's a slut and a whore for opening her legs too wide. What a bitch. Justice Alito argues the court has long been reluctant to recognize rights that are not mentioned in the Constitution. We must ask that the 14th Amendment, we must ask what the 14th Amendment means. The clear answer is that the 14th Amendment does not provide the right to an abortion. So, If you zone in on what he's saying, we must ask what the 14th Amendment means that's opening the door for reinterpretation. For a quick refresher, the 14th Amendment has four sections in it. Section 1 states, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privilege or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. One of Justices Alito's argument within the 14th Amendment is that the word woman is not recognized or included. Men are represented represented in section two with the use of the word male. Although the word person is used within the amendment, which can be applied to both male and female, that wasn't enough to convince Justice Alito that women have the right to privacy and privilege to choose when it comes to abortion care. This is why the ERA, the Equal Rights Act, is so important to ensure that women are represented through language in the constitution. And not just the language of women, but also the marginalized communities and people of color, specifically women of color. Because if Justice Alito is using the 14th Amendment to justify overturning Roe v. Wade, all rights previously protected under this amendment are up for grabs. And I'm going to list them. This is going to take a little bit because there's a lot of them. And I thought about, you know, reading just a few, but I think it's important to read all of them to take the time and give the space of how much impact this will have on these other important laws. The first one, marrying someone of a different race, Loving versus Virginia, 1967. Birth control, Griswold versus Connecticut, 1965. Einstadt versus Bard, 1972, and others. Now, This birth control is already happening. I've already shown some clips about how they're already starting in Idaho as well, wanting to over, uh, wanting to ban birth control and IUDs. Women with young children who want to work, Phillips versus Martin Marietta, 1971. Women's ability to preside over legal documents involving their kids, Reed versus Reed, 1971. Housing and benefits for female members of the armed services, 
Frontiero versus Richardson, 1973. Advertising jobs that specify only men can apply. Pittsburgh Press versus Pittsburgh Commission of Human Relations, 1973. Women who get pregnant on the job and are fired. Cleveland BOE versus Lafleur, 1974. Women who make less than men for the same work. Corning Glass Works versus Brennan, 1974. And we know on this one, as a side note, we know employers still break this law. It's repeatedly broken. Women's Right to Serve on Juries, Taylor v. Louisiana, 1975, J.E.B. v. Alabama, 1994. Social Security Benefits for Women, Weinberger v. Weisenfeld, Weisenfeld, 1975, Califano v. Gold Farb, 1977. Unemployment Benefits for Pregnant Women, Turner v. Department of Employment Security, 1975. Pregnant Women's Exclusion from Employer Health and Disability Plans, General Election v. Gilbert, 1976. Now, this one makes ensures that pregnant women have insurance, but it does not require, at that time, to provide um, pregnancy benefits with, within the insurance. And the reason I say this is because back in the 90s, I worked in the health insurance benefits with John Alden. And I remember how odd I felt and thought that it was that an employer could exclude pregnancy benefits from their employees. So although this makes sure that women have the right to employee health benefits, it does not require the employer to add pregnancy benefits. So thus it leaves the cost of birth of the child or children to the woman or the families. So, you know, it begs the question, I mean, all these wonderful things, why, why would a woman not want to have a baby? I mean, I just, I, I, it's just so hard to understand why she wouldn't want to have a baby with such a great environment to have one in. Like, just so confused. So moving on, women's right to get jobs traditionally held by men. Dothard versus Rawlinson, 1977. Pregnant woman's right to advance in the workplace. Nashville Gas versus... Sadie, 1977, Women of Colors Access to Hi- Higher Education, Regents of University of VAV, Bach, 1978, Fisher versus University of Texas, 2016, Benefits for Unemployed Moms, Califano versus Westcott, 1979, A Wife's Property Within a Marriage, Kirchberg versus Feenstra, 1980, Sexual Harassment in the Workplace, Meritor Savings Bank versus Vinson, 1986. Pregnant women who choose to work dangerous jobs, UAW versus Johnson Controls, 1991. Sexual harassment and abuse in secondary schools, Franklin versus Gwinnett County Public Schools, 1992. Gebser versus Ligo, Vistal ISD, 1998. Davis versus Monroe County, BOE, 1999. Women who want to attend a state-funded college of their choice, U.S. versus Virginia, 1996. Women's testimony in domestic violence, Davis versus Washington, 2006. The right to same-sex marriage, Ober- Obergfell versus Hodges, 2015. Something important to note is that the omission of women, people of color, LGBTQ, transgender, is a feature, not a malfunction in the amendments. Now, Hillary Clinton said it best in her speech on September 5th, 1995 at the United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women. If there is one message that echoes from this conference, it is that the human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human human rights. As long as discrimination and inequities remain so commonplace around the world, as long as girls and women are valued less, fed less, fed last, overworked, underpaid, not schooled, and subjected to violence in and out of their homes, the potential of human family to create a peaceful, prosperous world will not be realized. Replace the words woman or girl with women of color, people of color, LGBTQI, transgender, etc. communities, and it is applicable 
as well. It's interchangeable. Take care of the woman, you take care of the human. Take the right away from the woman, you take the right away from humanity. This is why it's important to lead with Black Lives Matter. Because when Black Lives Matter, then all lives matter. You take care of a Black life, you take care of all life. This goes hand in hand with women's rights. Taking away abortion rights is not the GOP's end game. Jessica Mason Piclo explained clearly when she was interviewed on Gaslit Nation podcast with Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa titled The Assault on Reproductive Rights. Here's a clip. In Texas right now, as of the time that we are having this conversation, we are 100 days into SB 8 being in effect. That is a bill that bans nearly all abortion in the state and empowers private citizens to act as bounty hunters to enforce this mechanism. It took it out of the hands of the state and empowered private citizens. This doesn't stop with abortion. This will go to voting rights. This will go to trans rights. This will go to marriage equality. The Texas lawmakers have all, Republicans have already said, do we really have to recognize marriage equality? So it's anti-democratic in that if you can make the argument that you can roll back rights in one area, the government can make that in others. And we're seeing that. And we know that because it's all tied up in the same line of case law. So if the government can make an argument to roll back precedent law in one area, it opens the door to the other. Statesman.com published an article on May 6, 2022 that states, Republican Greg Abbott wants Texas to challenge a 1982 U.S. Supreme Court ruling that requires states to offer free public education to all children, including those of undocumented immigrants. Well, we're talking about our rights, you know, freedom of speech, the right to bear arms. We're talking about our constitutional rights. Do you know how many amendments there are? Uh, are there have been 27 ratified amendments, right? Okay. Uh, Roe versus Wade is in the 14th Amendment. Do you know what that amendment is? That is that is uh, former slaves' citizenship, right? That's our citizenship. That's our due process. That's our equality clauses. And what we're talking about are women's rights to their own bodies. And so if we're cool with taking that away, the question becomes, are we cool with taking away rights now? Are we cool with infringing on rights all of a sudden? Because this is where it starts. The continued reinterpretation of the 14th Amendment can also kill the birthright citizenship and possibly revoke rights as a natural citizenship. I'm a natural naturalized citizen of the United States. I was born in Romania and immigrated here via my parents in the late 1970s. When Trump came into office, one of the first things I thought was, could my citizenship be revoked? This is not exaggerated or a hysterical thinking. This is a possibility. The 14th Amendment is in real time being reinterpreted. Everything is on the table. I am literally losing my rights as a woman. Same-sex marriage is in jeopardy. LGBTQI plus and transgender rights are at risk. Critical race theory is now being prohibited from being taught in schools. Books are being banned. The right to a free education is being challenged. Why would I not think my citizenship would be up for grabs? To not consider it or think it a possibility is ignorant. Now, some may say, I'm a white female. My privilege alone would spare me. And that's correct. I have privilege. And by the time it might affect me, all of this may be taken care of or prevented. But I'm not going to wait and take that chance and assume I won't be affected. Women of color, transgender, LGBTQI+, undocumented immigrants, and everyone that falls under the underrepresented and marginalized category will be affected first. This is why it's important to fight alongside these issues that impact them first, because by taking care of them, I will be taken care of and everybody else. And if men, and by men, I mean straight, mostly white men, and this is not meant as an insult. White men benefit from their privilege more than any other group. Just simply look at who's passing these laws. If you think that taking rights away won't come for you, I encourage you to watch this clip. We sincerely apologize for intruding. More the merrier. In bearing witness, we pray with you for a fruitful outcome. They used to do this in the first months of Gilead. 
to the households that resisted the ceremony. They declared it unnecessary. It's mere formality, Mrs. Lawrence, shoring up those households that have had difficulties with handmaids. Bearing witness ensures that every member of the family is performing their role. Any deviation could tip the scales to failure. sit here quietly for 20 minutes and then we can we will go go down we can't just sit here we can play um canasta <laughs> got some cards up here the doctor is going to check me afterwards for the proof that there was a ceremony <sighs> You Helena, swore we would never we need have to be quiet. We don't have to do it. it. Quiet. Stop. We need to stop. We don't have to do anything. Sir. Yes, we do. You helped to create this world. How long did you think it would be before it came for you? Every government makes room for exceptions. This one ends with both of you on the wall. Don't wait for someone to ask you. How long did you think it would be before it came for you? Although this all seems heavy and hopeless, it's important to remember that there is still time to prevent this from happening. I shared a clip from Gaslit Nation podcast. That is an excellent podcast to follow and use as a resource of information. Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa are experts on authoritarian states. They also provide an action guide on gaslitnation.com that provides a pathway to engage in the community to create positive change and challenge, prevent, and stop current lawmakers from passing corrupt policies. We as women need to come together and share our stories and support each other and keep the conversation going about women's rights. This is why I started this podcast, to get our stories out, to get our viewpoints out. All women, all walks of life, our voices matter too. Men, we need you as allies. We are stronger with you in these matters because men will listen to other men more so than women. It's important that you show up for the women in your lives and support their choices. Listen to women's stories and what choices they had to make in order to function within a patriarchal society. Fight alongside them for rights and educate men on how to see women as equals. If we come together, we are stronger and can get more done. I want to end my opening with this clip because at, because at Empress Onyx, that's her, um, her, uh, I forget what it's called, but that's how you can look her up on TikTok and maybe on Twitter, but at Empress Onyx brings up some points worth thinking about. So I have been researching one of our uh, future discussions, which will be on forced sterilization, right? I was doing my research came across the story of a Latina physician who had gone into the hospital uh, for acute appendicitis and they sterilized her. Right? Um, she finds out that there are black women and there are Native American women with similar stories. They go in for one thing and they get sterilized. She finds out about the sisters who were sterilized at 12 and 14 because they lied. The hospital lied to the mother and said, oh, no, you're just consenting, you know, for us to put them on birth control. She learns these things and she wants to end this practice of forced sterilization. So she starts lecturing. She travels 
the country lecturing, advocating for the end of this practice. And what she learns is she learns this from white women who come up after the lectures complaining because they can't get sterilized, complaining because they have to wait too long. The wait list is too long for them to get sterilized, that they're flat out told no, right? They have to jump through a ridiculous amount of hoops just to get sterilized. And this physician realized that they made it harder for white women to get sterilized, but they came up with any reason under the sun to sterilize women of color. Now, I want you to think about that story in light of what is most likely going to happen, and that's the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And now, Here is part two of my interview with Zoe Kelly. That question of, okay, well, what would Zoe want to, what would, what did Zoe want to know three years ago? Like, that's a, that's a really smart question to, to kind of pose and explore on. Yeah. And see, um, to, you know, to make those videos, like, that's pretty good. Makes me think. Yeah, then you're then you know you have you have a built-in audience. There are people who are heady and people who are learning what you have already learned. You know, as far as your knowledge goes, yeah. and so it's like, why don't you grab the hand of another young actress and help her along instead of just making stupid, you know, meaningless content? And I've found much more joy and satisfaction in my social media since taking that that standpoint mm-hmm. of oh uh, you know instead of being like oh I'm feeling cute today I'm gonna post a cute pic mm-hmm. it's now like how what can I how can I be of service to someone else yeah this has just been like a message that keeps coming into my life like how can you serve other people because yeah. I like naturally I'm a very selfish person I just am like I it doesn't matter why You know, I think it was definitely my therapist says (laughs) that it was a coping mechanism, (laughs) but you know, it doesn't matter what it, what matters is like, now I have the choice to either, you know, just be a robot and continue doing what I've been doing or grow as a person. And so I'm choosing, well, how can I be of service to other people? And it is paying off, you know, like that, that commercial light. I got cast in was because of my content on social media, not my self tape, not my demo reel, not my headshot. It was the monologue Mondays that I've been putting up Mm -hmm. and putting a shitload of work into. And this casting director, this director was like, you can act. I want you. You can't tell if someone can act from a one line self tape. Yeah. You really can't. No, I, yeah, I, I agree with you there. And so that was very, very uh, validating. That's, that is so wonderful to hear. Um, And the amount of work that does go into those. I I think that there is sometimes an assumption, oh, you could just post and maybe for some, yeah, they can just do that and then do the one, two and get 1.2 million, (laughs) you know, likes or, or whatnot. But I agree when you really want to put something of quality that has depth, that is of service, it does take time and that work does pay off, you know, and this will only continue to grow. And it's so wonderful how you're exploring all those parts and just continue to expand in it, you know, and listening, listening to the direction that you're like, yeah, I think I need to go this way. Yeah. Um, and then the selfish aspect that you brought up, um, how interesting you saying that, cause that doesn't come across necessarily. You know what I mean? That it's in, I don't know. I find it fascinating. I, I'm trying to be more cognizant of interesting. My brother said, you say interesting a lot, but it's interesting. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so I'm really going to look back on all this and be like, God, interesting. <laughs> so what's it called? Switch up the words a little bit. I don't know, whatever. Um, and like my brother's going to listen to this anyway. Um, but I really appreciate um, the sort of self-reflection in that because the way that you're you speak on being of service and coming to that point makes me uh, think 
there's an empathic quality to you as well because you're able to sort of read and and taking that time in your spiritual journey as well do you find that you have some empath qualities yeah also? I definitely for a long time identified as like an empath I think through you know therapy and self-reflection I learned that those traits as well are a product of the environment that I grew up in. I had to be very aware of micro expressions for my own survival. And um, so I am really good at reading a room. You know, I am pretty good at understanding where people are at in their, their thought process and their, their feelings, maybe not their thought process, but their emotional experience Mm -hmm. and um I think that also contributed to my acting experience in my younger years where I was able to harness that emotional state of being and live in the emotionality of storytelling Mm -hmm. um yeah I I do think I'm pretty empathetic but up until pretty recently, a lot of my inner dialogue, conscious or subconscious, usually subconscious, was what can I get out of the situation? How does this benefit me? Mm -hmm. Is this good enough for me? You know, this really counterproductive thoughts and and paradigm. Mm -hmm. And really, honestly, pretty recently, I've had a really big spiritual awakening and paradigm shift of I need to be of service to people. That's my purpose in life. I'm not here to serve myself. I'm here to serve others. And, you know, that that's been a big reason why I've been saying yes to a lot of projects that maybe I would have said no to before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way that I wanted to approach this podcast with you instead of, you know, very easily when someone asks you to be on a podcast, you can in the past, I, I'm using the general you, but I want to focus on me <laughs> in my not selfishness. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but my experience, strength, and hope is that I was able, in the past, I was more apt to say, oh, my ego, I deserve to be on this podcast. I'm amazing, but in a very like shallow, you know, toot my own horn way. Mm. Whereas today I was like, how can I be of service to the listeners? How can I be of service to you? And I think that has made it, made me be able to be more vulnerable and more open and honest than I normally would be if my ego was leading the show. Mm -hmm. And I think that authenticity is, has been serving me and will continue to serve me more than selfishness. Yeah. Well, in coming to the um, listening to the sort of prompting, be of service, be of service, demonstrates a, that level of spiritual growth as well. The active listening in it and then the act behind it. Um, was it a small events that led to that spiritual awakening? Was that something that occurred last year, you know, within the during the pandemic or how recent and sort of how did all that come about to where you're like, yep, I'm, you know, and then that process of embracing and deciding, yeah, it reminds me a little bit of a hero's journey, but from a, <laughs> but from a feminine standpoint, because the feminine hero journey is a little bit different than the, than the hero journey, although some aspects are the same, but that where you're like, okay, I'm not going to fight this anymore. I'm going to step into it. Yeah, I, um, I was experiencing some personal struggles with some very bad habits. Um, I was uh, abusing alcohol pretty severely for about two years, but it really came to a head um, in about January, February. And I had a lot of waking up in literal gutter moments and I realized that if I continued on that path, that I probably wasn't going to make it for much longer. And so I had to ask for help. And, you know, when you have a substance abuse disorder, there's a lot of stigma that comes along with it. And there is a surprising amount of red tape in getting help. 
Um, unfortunately, you know, I, my options were very limited when I came to the understanding that I was powerless over my habits and, you know, everyone knows or a lot, it's very common knowledge about AA, Mm -hmm. which is a very spiritual based program, which I have been attending and attempting to work. Um, but you know, I'm, I haven't been a very spiritual person in my life, um, kind of ebbs and flows. I never had a religious upbringing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, my mom's an atheist. I identified as a late atheist for a long time. And, um, so getting help in a spiritual realm has been really challenging for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was able to get my doctor on board with prescribing a medication that helps you not want to drink. It actually it uncouples your hippocampus, mm-hmm. where in 10% of the population, you get, and I believe I am part of this 10%, I only receive um, euphoria from drinking when my blood alcohol level is increasing. And so that causes a tendency to overdrink. Because if I have one drink, it's kind of annoying. Mm -hmm. I want to keep chasing that high. Mm -hmm. And so it was causing me to drink a really dangerous amount of alcohol pretty regularly. And I'm really fortunate after a lot of struggle and trials, I was able to get on this medication that is curbing any cravings for alcohol and also uh, uncoupling euphoria and alcohol. So in the future... I won't associate pleasure with booze, which is like Mm -hmm. crazy that science has come this far because back even in the 1930s, it was like, well, you better pray your problems away. Yeah. Which really. (laughs) How effective is that? Yes. Yes. Because I've woken up hungover many a time saying, please don't let me drink again. If anyone's listening out there, God or whatever. And I would just do it again and do it again and do it again. And so, you know, yeah. through through these struggles and through my experience, I have been starting to pray. I mean, I use air quotes, but I have been yeah. who I'm praying to or what I'm praying to. I have no idea. And I also don't really care because I've found a new serenity and a new peace inside myself mm-hmm. after removing the alcohol from my life. And just trying to embrace being authentic and being comfortable in my own skin. That is powerful enough for me right now. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if any of that made sense, but it did did make sense. Um, I so appreciate you sharing that because it's so important because in the end, it, it, you really have to come back to yourself. So that higher power is within every single human. We all have it and it exists and it's just a matter of returning to our higher power. So when I hear you say that you pray, that you pray, uh, what pops up is that meditation, that serenity, that oneness with yourself. And that is the higher power that in, in my spiritual journey, I guess, coming out of my sort of, <laughs> very strict I would say it's a cult-like type of religious yeah. background but you know where it's really refrained and I think even as a society we re- we step away from going within and it's more everything get up you know what can we get on the outside but then when you do the journey like you um, described with where you had to remove that obstacle and then really go within I see that oneness you know that that sort of that prayer uh, mode, not in a religious way, but more of I am one with the universe, with the higher power. I am the higher power. The higher power is me. Yes. And whatever. And it doesn't need a name. You know, I think, and I, and I think there is always a desire to label something or I, you know, I did and it can just be and exist, you know? And so it's, yeah, I, I love hearing all the different journeys and, and, ways that you know we can come to that realization within ourselves yeah and the amount of power that we have within ourselves you know and and 
how that can then be used for service. Absolutely. You know, it just, that's just, again, it just more deliciousness. Like it's like, I can, I taste like what I'm experiencing and what you're sharing. I'm experiencing in my senses, like not just feeling, um, you know, getting, it's making me want to bust out and cry. Like I'm trying to hold it in and be all like, cool. Like, yeah. <laughs> I can interview and this tear will not fall. <laughs> but inward, I'm just like, gulp it, you know? But it's, you know, it's, those are the beautiful moments of sharing and making connections with humanity is being able to experience those things on a non-artificial chemical level. Like you experience yeah. it in a very natural form. Yeah. And um, and, ta- and it, you can take it with you and it stays with you in a much longer way than when it passes through the brain and it's that euphoria is not gone. It's still, it's in a very spiritual way still there because, you know, you can carry it with you. So it's such a joy to hear. Yeah, I've definitely, that resonates with me feeling closer to myself because in my experience, the alcohol was really deadening any connection I had with something as simple as my hunger mm-hmm. um, and something as profound as my deepest desires and goals in life. You know, it, it really was a poor band-aid over a lot of things that I still have to work through, a lot of trauma I still need to heal, but it was a hindrance. It was not a helper at least towards the end there. So I'm really, really grateful to be sober and to be able to share my experience with other people in hopes to provide a little maybe ease or solidarity Mm -hmm. with someone who may be experiencing the same thing. And and it doesn't necessarily have to be in in the alcohol, in that form, in a drink form. It can be in a different form of whatever substance is being used, you know, and it doesn't even have to be a substance. It could be a a relationship or a person or, you know, emotional, whatever, whatever that may be. It's, it's, uh, same content, just different packaging. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Oh yeah. Compulsions come in many different sizes. Yes. Different bows, different, you know, zigzag stars, beautiful paintings. (laughs) Oh yeah. (laughs) Um, and so, um, let's kind of dive into, since we're on that human connection type of thing, how did you connect with your husband mm. and how is that process? And how is that process in terms, just from like a female perspective, you're connecting, you're partnering now and how are you growing together? Yeah. Yeah. My, our relationship, I mean, we have a very cute, how we met story, mm-hmm. you know, but, um, my husband's name is Elliot Norton. He owns uh, Lower Gentry Studios with his brother. Mm-hmm. I'm a part of that now. But um, before I was a part of it, I auditioned for his first feature film, Brown Truck. Mm-hmm. And he cast me. We made a movie. And I was just in awe and in love with how intelligent both of these Norton brothers are. I mean, Chuck and Elliot are just brilliant and kind and authentic and funny. And it was just when I was in their presence, I felt so safe and just so seen and just like I had found my home. And, you know, I knew when the movie wrapped that I just, I didn't want to stop spending time with them, you know? And, uh, so we shortly, you know, shortly thereafter, we started dating, uh, Elliot and I. But uh, it was interesting because up until that point, I had only actually dated women and I actually identified as a lesbian. And so when I started catching feelings for this boy, yeah. I was a little confused. Yeah. I was like, wait a second. What? What's <laughs> happening? Your parts are too. Yeah, I'm a little confused. <laughs> You're just not my type. Um, And by that, I mean gender. So it was very confusing. And it took a long time for me to be like, this is okay. Because a lot of my identity had been wrapped up in, you know, that sexual orientation that I had identified with since I was 14. Um, But, you know, I just realized that I maybe like people regardless of their gender. I just had never met a man that I was attracted to. 
And I'm sure a lot of that does have to do with the power dynamics and the patriarchy that we live in. Mm -hmm. Because I have a very huge problem with authority and awkward, uneven power dynamics really bother me. Um, But I never felt that way with these, with the Norton brothers. I never felt like I was not their equal. You know, I knew they respected what I was doing. And they would tell me they respected what I was doing and they would treat me with respect. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just feel really blessed that they came into my life and that I get to share my life with, you know, my husband and his brother is, we're all very tight. We create everything, you know, our film projects together. And and I just love them deeply. And, you know, Brad or Elliot um, has been just a, a rock through my journey, you know, he and I have a very good relationship, a very respectful relationship. He, um, he used to be a social worker for like four and a half years. And now he's a special ed teacher, you know, by day. Oh, how awesome. And so he's, his emotional intelligence is like light years beyond a lot of people that I've met. And so the way we communicate is just super effective and very compassionate. And when it's not, we're able to recognize that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I am growing, he is growing. And at least right now where we're at in our relationship, Mm -hmm. we're able to support and have space for each other to grow together, um, which I'm really grateful for. Wow. That is so beautiful. One thing um, I noticed when you you sort of posted when I had Facebook and you um, those sort of, you know, were just sharing moments that you had together. I noticed how supportive he was of you and how how it almost kind of like he was just so excited to share that he's with you. And that struck out, even if it was just a picture or there was just an openness there that was really lovely to um, see because you could see that equal respect you know what I mean like you're describing that does come across and um, it's rare you 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 don't because those power dynamics do exist in a lot of relationships regardless of whether they're conscious or unconscious Um, so it's always wonderful to see one where you know you're both coming together and working together as partners in that way and yeah that's something that I always admired you Thank know you. In, in in seeing your journey and and how both of you just sort of post because you know the algorithm how it works like if you like something then it you know shows so you're unable without having to be friends with everybody you could see all parts of their lives depending on what you liked that's what would come up on the feed yeah and so, or just what you shared and what he commented on. And I just always thought that that was, it was just nice. It was cute, but not in a cliche cute kind of way. It was just, it was just nice. Thank you. Because you know, yeah. it is. And it'd be nice to yeah. see more of that, you know, to see more sharing of that or, or people coming together in that way more, yeah. you know, for that to be more normalized versus a, like a power dynamic. And that, and that goes for all type of relationships, whether it's same-sex relationships or whichever, however that that looks like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, however each person identifies. No, absolutely. I think you make a good point where those uneven power dynamics can happen in any, you know, type of relationship, any gender relationships. I dated a lot of women where we had very uneven power dynamics, and it's not exclusive to male-female relationship at all yeah I think what it comes down to for me and Elliot at least is like first and foremost he's my best friend like and I know that sounds cliche but it's true yeah that's that's what makes it beautiful too and and he's a very he's a staunch atheist but he did tell me that uh I am his soulmate so I consider that a win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's like, I don't believe that we have souls, but there's no other word in the in the English language to describe this. So you are my soul. Mm-hmm. He's very. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love that. And atheists, I feel like sometimes they get such a bad rap because of not uh, having this higher power that they look to, or you know what I mean. And I say they as if it's they are an other. No. <laughs> 
they are not an other. They are part of the whole as well. It's just looking at it from a different viewpoint. That's yeah. it. And and I think it's fascinating. I enjoy hearing um, athe- an atheist. I don't want to say they or an, as if it's an other. I always feel like it's categorizing them out here, and they're not out there. They're a part. Um, but I, I enjoy hearing the perspective of um, how an atheist thinks, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that sounds weird. How can I put the language correctly? But um, I do yeah. too. He definitely challenges me like intellectually a lot, mm-hmm. which I need because I'm a very intellectual person and I can get bored really easily yeah, yeah. Uh, because of that. And so he, I mean, yeah, lots of, last night we were having this uh, conversation about atheism actually. And nice. he was just saying, uh, I was, a, he's a little bit older than me. He, he said, uh, I was about your age when I realized that I am not in my body. I am my body. So a lot of people think of it as driving a spaceship, but I am the spaceship. Mm. And he said, I found that to be really freeing and liberating, but I can also understand why people need a higher power in their lives because that idea can be terrifying to some people. And he's just very accepting of where I'm at on my journey. You know, right now I do have a spiritual practice. I am praying. I am looking for signs and, you know, praying for help because I need it, you know, right now. Right. And, and he's very understanding of that, but he's also willing to maybe not challenge, but express a, another way of viewing the world, which I find to be just awesome. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. Um, and then that is, this is kind of a nice lead in with, since we're talking a little bit about power dynamic and, you know, in, in relationships it, as a female in the industry um, or any service industry, regardless of where it is, just as your experience, how is your um, experience as uh, just a female compared to that with your male counterparts or even with, you know, um, with your husband in terms of you guys have sort of a balance and an equal, but how, when you two go out, mm-hmm. how are you received? Are you received in that equal sort of mm. way that you are together? Right. Or is there sort of a difference in that one because of sort of the production company, but also, you know, how does gender play a, play a role in that too? Yeah. Um, when you were speaking that my mind immediately went to, um, we so we do a lot of mixers and and presentations or whatever viewings of our projects together and we do go out and i do have writing credit and producing credit on a lot of our projects i am very so much an equal creator in a lot of our projects mm-hmm. he is our head writer and i will say that he's a phenomenal writer and i can I am literate, but I am not a writer. <laughs> um, so I come up with ideas and I can, you know, shit out a first draft, but he's really, you know what I mean? Yes, a writer. Yeah. You're a, you're a poet, you're a writer. There's a difference. I hear you. And so, um, I do see when we go out to some of these events that he is definitely deferred to more. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if gender plays a role in that or if it is the way I present myself and he presents himself in a crowd. Um, but I, I just remember one time we were at an after party um, at a bar mm-hmm. and <clears throat> we're there with other people in the community and an old friend from high school comes up to me and gra- a, a male comes up to me and grabs me around the waist. And it's like, hey, it's so good to see you. And I'm like, what's up? Oh, yeah. da, 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 da. And it's all cool. Like, we are fine, me and my friend from high school. But there's another individual from in the crowd from this event we were at who is looking at me and looking at my husband and looking at me, looking at my husband. Like, are you going to get your woman in check? There's someone touching your woman right now. And I didn't notice this. Elliot noticed it. Wow. And so he came over and started talking to us like, oh, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. And he's the one that expressed that to me later. And I was just so uncomfortable. I was like, I am not this gentleman's property. Like, yeah. and, and Elliot knows that I'm a very independent person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I will, you know, and we, we respect each other. So there's no worries about crossing boundaries, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So it, it's just very interesting. There's definitely a difference. Um, that I've experienced. And then of course, you know, what you hear a lot of just the sexual 
assault, harassment, um, a lot of that, that negative attention that, of course, I've experienced a lot of, I'm sure most women have. And um, it's really hard to navigate that in a small film community when it happens within the community. Mm -hmm. Um, I had an incident happen with an individual that works in the film community where I was assaulted by them sexually. And I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't know what to do at all. And I was so caught off guard and surprised because I trusted this person, Mm -hmm. which I'm sure is usually the scenario. And I was married and they knew I was married. And and so it was just a very unfortunate situation. And I chose not to, you know, put them on blast on social media for fear of, you know, what it would do to my reputation or people would think I'm just attention seeking or, you know, all the stigmas that go along with women who speak their truth. Mm -hmm. And so that was a very hard incident to overcome. And I still struggle with it. And so how were you able, I mean, what's, what did you do within yourself since um, calling that person out that you decided probably was not, and it's so unfortunate that we even have to think about those things. How is it going to impact? Because they, are they thinking that? Do they have to worry about that, you know? Um, Or even have tone policing ourselves, making sure we don't, you know, or too aggressive if we come across, you know, that sort of thing. But so then how within yourself, how how was that process of um, finding, moving forward? Because I I don't know if has healing occurred or is still in the process of occurring. And what do you have to do within and have you come across that person since then? And then what? what do what does that look like in terms of how you're able to work through yeah through you know i just i think it's really interesting because i i had a a sexual assault happen when i was younger um like a man broke into my home and uh violated me and i was able to call the police 2 hours after it happened and um they were prosecuted and spent time in prison and um, and then this incident happened and it was, it was more recent. It was in 2017 and, um, he was a white man, uh, whereas my first perpetrator was, um, Afghani, a refugee from Afghanistan. Wow. And I think that definitely played a part in why I didn't report, um, the incident because I think inherently I knew that it would do nothing but cause more trauma because I had already been through one trial and it was not a walk in the park, even though our system, you know, in that situation probably favored me because I'm a white woman. Mm -hmm. Let's just call it like it is. I understand that's probably why he was prosecuted. Um, But this incident was with a white man and I just knew that no one saw anything. It would be his word against mine. And I just wasn't willing to put myself through that trauma. And so I really just, I mean, it took a lot of processing. I think I'm still processing it. Um, I haven't seen them since. And if I did, I I don't know what I would do. It makes me ill to think about it. Yeah. But I was able to eventually, you know, tell my husband and tell a really small few members in the community, call him out by name and just say, if you work with him, be careful. Do not hire him if you are in that position to do that. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, and I I haven't shared it with a lot of people. I maybe can count them on one hand Mm -hmm. because there is a very real fear of backlash. Um, because I saw, I've seen it happen. I've seen women in the film community in Boise say things about other men and, you know, get a, a Salem witch trial for speaking what happened. Yeah. And it's like, that's not worth it. 
Yeah. I will just warn the women close to me about what happened and warn the maybe the bigger names in the industry so he doesn't get any more paid work. Right. And just, you know, move on and never put myself in a position like that again. And I also rehearsed because I read that it's good to get it in your body and your voice, what I could do if that situation happened again. So I I definitely did the very traditional female thing of laughing it off, trying not to make it a big deal. You don't want to make them uncomfortable after I was assaulted. Right. Oh my gosh. And now I'm just like, I'm, I'm ready. If that situation happens again, I have a plan. I have a script. You know, mm-hmm. I, I will perform the role, <laughs> yes. which is sad, but that you even have because it takes courage then to 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 do it, to apply it because of everything you just described, you know, underneath and what would be it'd be sometimes even standing up to that person, what that person does as a result of you standing up can be just as detrimental you know what I mean? Yeah. As n- not, or even speaking out or not saying anything or, and it's such a fine line. And it's, what's frustrating is that there is not an understanding from, um, from, you know, the opposite the gender, you know, I, I want to be careful not to say men as if I'm talking about all men, I'm not talking about all men. I'm talking specifically about those men that do those toxic behaviors and take advantage of, of those moments, knowing that they can get away with it. I'm talking about just to that specifically, because there are good men out there that can be allies with us. And I think it's so important that those allies step up with us and, and teach other men or call them out alongside us. So that way, both the voices, you know, resonate Um, because that partnership has to be there in order for change to truly happen As women just ourselves, we can do a lot, but we can do even more if they would just step in with us and not take it personally that when someone says men, it's not referring to all men. It's referring to just those men um, who just do, because there's a lot of them out there, unfortunately, and they've created such an environment that we're trying to navigate through. And the things that we have to think about just in tone policing and making sure we're approachable, but not too flirtatious, but then what if it's not flirtatious enough? Or, you know, are they think, you know, if they think of misunderstanding our signals and then having to make sure that they feel comfortable, just, just as you, you know, sort of described, it's, it's just, I don't know. It's, I wonder how, you know, small steps are being taken, but I wonder what would it look like if truly both, you know, men and women just came together and, in more in more numbers, you know there is a, a nice pocket of here and there, but just in more numbers coming up and backing backing each other up. Well, and I think a lot of it has to do. Obviously, you know, there's been studies done that show that rape and and other sexual assaults are really due to it. It's not a sexual thing; it's really power related. Mm-hmm. And so, I think there's a lot of Uh, change that can be made maybe in empowering both men and women in a truer sense. And then also, I really do think that a more comprehensive sex education system, where instead of just, you know, teaching women how to not get roofied, how to hold your drink while you're in the club, or to carry your keys in between your hands when you walk, or all of these tricks that our moms and our aunts and maybe even our dads taught us to not get raped. Should we maybe be teaching young men, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, how not to rape women instead of this sex is a secret, either learn it from your parents, maybe if they tell you anything about it or learn it from pornography, which is very unhealthy and glorifies rape culture it's like when we ask ourselves why are these problems occurring it's a systemic problem that stems from sex education or lack thereof Mm -hmm. I didn't get sex education until I was 18 and I was in like a a, not a school environment obviously Mm -hmm. and I was finally taught about STDs and condoms and all of these racy things 
taboo to uh, speak of them. It's the <laughs> and it's just like this is causing teen pregnancies, unwanted pregnancies, STDs, rape, and probably a myriad of other issues that I'm not even cognizant of. Mm-hmm. And it makes me think what you're saying um, that um, the, the – I saw it both on Twitter and I want to say I saw it once on Facebook or maybe it was Instagram where the question was put out, if men did not exist, what would you do for a day? It was posed out to women. And the highest response was go jogging at night or just go out freely without worrying about, you know, what you have to like watch out for and, and just be cognizant of, you know, and it's just, I don't know. That's interesting. I mean, I think most women can attest to the fact that at least me personally, I've been followed in the grocery store. I've been followed downtown at night. I've been followed, you know, in a, in a club, you know, there are very real predatorial behaviors that women experience and that don't get talked about. I never talk about this ever because it's, I mean, there is shame. There is shame about, well, what am I doing so wrong that this is happening to me? That very like victim blame mindset that's just like ingrained in me, at least personally. Yeah, no, I think that's across the board because you hear that often. What you're saying pops up. I remember a a conversation with uh, my friend. She's broken up with me since. But at the time, we were really good friends. And she we were talking about rape and what if, you know, our like, what if it happened to our daughters and, you know, heaven forbid, or, you know, just playing out scenarios. Um, and, you know, she immediately went to, well, you know, better not make sure to wear something. What if, you know, she's doing, I'm like, well, what way, why are we putting it on them? Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what she's wearing. She's not wearing that to invite, but because that has been set out there as an intention spoken for the woman instead of allowing the woman to speak for herself of why she's wearing what she's wearing, because she freaking feels good about herself. Yeah. That doesn't mean she wants someone coming up her pants, Yeah, you know, or, or forcing herself. But it's also this idea that goes back to that power dynamic you mentioned where sex is not about sex. It's about power because there is still that difference of um, where it is expected that women are here, you know, for the pleasure of men or, for in some way men because of that good old, you know, woman was taken from the Adam's rib, yeah. you know, and created. And if we really kind of look at it a little bit, we'll find that, you know, maybe just a bit different. <laughs> it's not quite. And who wrote it and why? And I don't know. Questions should be asked there. I feel like, I think so, you know, but um, in, in your experience, how with it happening recently, how, um, also, was it for Elliot with you, you and him? So how was that for the both of you, you having to deal and make, deciding this is the way that I want to go? And then how did did he sort of respond to that choice and, and support you? Yeah, it was a really hard uh, conversation, you know, and and I felt very... He was very angry, naturally. I was pretty angry too. Um, I felt more violated, but I think he shared that with me because he loves me and, you know, I'm, I don't want to say I'm an extension of him, but, you know, we are very close. And so he, you know, felt very full of rage and like, you know, pretty seriously was asking where this gentleman worked and things like that. And like any person naturally would, when you hear this news, I thought the same exact thing. And, um, you know, he, (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing because it's sad. Um, (laughs) but there were a lot of tears shed and you know at the end of the day he expressed to me it's your story it's your assault whatever you choose to do I will be here to support you I did think about going to the police Mm 
because that's what I did my first time. And, and he said, okay, if you want to go through with that, I will be there every step of the way. I will be there. I will hold your hand. I will be your shoulder to cry on. I will be there with you, Mm -hmm. whatever you want to do. And, and that allowed me the space to make my own decision because I do think I, I can look outside myself for what's best for me. (laughs) I don't know why. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. (laughs) But he he gave me the space and really didn't weigh in other than saying, I'm here. And that's what I needed. Mm -hmm. And I just, over the course of about three weeks, came to understand that I wanted to warn other women that I saw on social media working with him um, because I didn't want anyone else to get hurt. Um, But I didn't want to put myself through trying to prosecute a, you know, middle-class white man Mm -hmm. in a he said, she said scenario. It just wasn't worth the trauma because I know that I would not have been believed. And I didn't want to put them on blast on social media because it felt gratuitous. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really want people to know that that had happened also because I felt disgusting Mm -hmm. that shame that shame that you described yeah but I was able to like I said tell um you know we I was doing a project I just finished a performance Mm -hmm. and I was able to tell that director and you know certain things transpired where this individual is not welcome in this area anymore and um I was able to tell some you know, people like I mentioned earlier. And so I haven't seen or heard from them since. Um, But Elliot did run into them once after. And so how, what did that look like? Was There was a lot of emotions on his end. Yeah. He, you know, it's very interesting how, you know, people, not just men, me too, want to meet violence with violence. Mm -hmm. Um, There's, that's very real human instinct. But, you know, he didn't do anything. He didn't say anything. He just, you know, did not engage. But I can't imagine. I can't. I, I, even as a female, I can't imagine the, what he felt. Yeah. The, the restraint he probably had to have to not act and, and, you know, respond whichever way you really probably wanted to. Yeah. And, and the way that I heard it, at least from an individual that was also there is once that this perpetrator saw my husband there, they left Wow. because they knew, Yeah. they knew what happened was wrong. It's not something that's up for debate. Yeah. And since, since then, um, is, did he become more protective for a little while? Was he, worried a little bit more when you went on set or projects or just out, you know, just in general, did, did you find he was checking in maybe just to make sure everything's okay? (laughs) Maybe a little bit extra because of a higher vigilance, you know? Yeah. Well, he was definitely the one that encouraged me to practice what would happen if anything like this happened again. So we rehearsed it together. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he, he was He's an action-oriented rationalist. So he knew that he couldn't be there to protect me in every situation. I'm a very independent person. And so he just said, you need to get this in your body. It's like, let's just practice it. And I want you to pretend that I'm this person and this just happened. What are you going to say? Like, practice what you're going to do, your physicalities. Like, And we just like rehearsed it in our living room old house and it's so sad that we had to do that but it's also freaking cool that he would give me those tools yeah and be there with you to practice I would love to see like shorts of that (laughs) I think that that would be so awesome that the first thing as you described it I was like where's the real (laughs) I need to see this so I can share it and learn myself (laughs) do you know what I mean yeah I did think about creating that content after it happened. Oh my gosh. Like that would be, I would love to, if you did end up, you know, taking this and be like, Oh, maybe I should, I would, I think that that would be so awesome to see both of you because it's again, that partnership, you're showing so many things there, the partnership that you have, his support, 
and how he's trying to navigate with you through all of this. And you're trying to take something that was just really not good and just, you know, um, traumatizing and sort of create it as an opportunity to sort of share and learn and learn, meaning give some tools, learn yourself, but also, you know, pass it on. Maybe be of service. Yes. <laughs> yeah. mm, give me <laughs> ideas. Yes. yes. Oh my gosh. I'd be like, 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 where's the multiple like button? <laughs> Why is it just once? It only hearts, hearts, hearts when it's like live or something. Then you can be like, like, no, I need it. So that way, every time she opens it, like bursts out in hearts. I love it. <laughs> they need to recreate that, you know. Yes. I would use that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I love live feeds. I'm like, yes, yeah. Heart, heart, heart. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I am just so grateful that you um again are open and and you know allowing the space to to share that that vulnerability because I just think it's so important and I feel very blessed to that that you feel comfortable enough to um be able to to share all of these moments that are so important um and that need to be spoken and that's one of the goal with this podcast is to begin normalizing that it's okay to talk about it because we're not talking about it in a way to pull down or to be a woe is me. Sharing the story allows others to connect. So that way to empower, the whole goal is to empower. And I just feel like this is such an opportunity to empower. I agree. You know, through, through what you're willing and open to share. And I am just so grateful for that. It, it fills my heart so much that, that you trust um, our, our, trusting just this space, you know, to do that. So, well, thank you for providing this space for the community. I think it's really important for women to be able to share their stories. And like you said, just share their experience with other people. I mean, there's nothing worse than feeling like you're alone and there's no bigger fallacy in the world because there's so many people that share our struggles or adjacent struggles and, I hope to be able to open myself more to the world and to others around me in hopes to help another struggling human being. Yes. Because it's no fun. Yes. To do it alone. I I hear you. I hear you. That's such a feeding the soul. Um, And then that kind of leads into our last few questions here, which is then how can we empower sort of women to come together right because there's a lot of times where and it makes me think of many stories that I've heard um, from women of color uh, specifically black women where they uh, Gabrielle Union you you, I hope I'm saying her name uh, last name correctly she talked about how the because there were so few black female roles that they end up being in competition with each other. So it created sort of a mean girl type of scenario. And she mm. called herself out on it and had that self-reflection. That makes me think just women in general, we kind of do that because our roles are, are um, we don't get as much time as male counterparts in a uh, majority of, of the movies. That is slowly changing. So I always want to make sure to acknowledge that. But how do we then sort of not just empower women, but then also how can we bring that community to together so that way we're championing each other and not t- shifting the competition to encouraging. And even though, yes, we aren't competing for the same role, but how can we be happy for each other? How can we embrace and celebrate together, you know, and all, and all of those things? Yeah. How do you think? Yeah. That's a great question. I think it's like twofold where my mind's at, at least like, Firstly, one of my best friends is also an actress and we are in the same typecast. Um, We've worked on two projects together in the years that we've known each other because we are very similarly aged and looks and things like this, Um, at least for the limited roles that are available. We don't really look that similar, but we go out for a lot of the same roles and I don't know how or why or what cosmic force caused it, but we both are constantly encouraging each other and like helping each other, giving each other positive feedback and 
you know, she'll ask me, how can I better prep for this situation? And I'll ask her, Hey, what do you think about this? And it's, you know, we went out for a pretty big project, um, a couple months ago for the same role and the casting director called us in for the same role. And we both worked our little butts off to get this role. It was a big project and she got a call back and I did not. And I was so devastated for myself and I allowed myself seven hours to be absolutely devastated. And then after that point, I called her and I was like, congratulations, what can I do to help you prepare? Like, you're going to slay this. And it's just like, you can be sad for yourself maybe, or a little disappointed, but you can't necessarily be precious about an audition. And I think it's so much more important to support the women in your life or the people in your life. Mm So that's where my mind goes for that and just connecting with your community. And then also, you know, for especially for people of color, women of color and helping, you know, giving a space or having a space to have these voices heard in my experience, what I'm choosing to do um, at BSU next semester, there is a play that is mainly um, Latinx uh, casting, but in the casting breakdown, it said, Hey, ideally we would like the people to be, you know, Latinx, but we'll consider other ethnicities if we don't get enough turnout. And I just thought, absolutely not. This is a story written in the Latin community, you know, should be portrayed by Latinx people. And so I'm choosing not to audition. I don't feel like it's my, I feel like this is a perfect opportunity for me to help build the set to help, you know, do hair and makeup to take another role in the theater and allow a space for these stories to be told Mm -hmm. by these people of color. It's not all about me. How can I be of service to tell this story in the best way? And so I think what a lot of us maybe should do is take a step back and say, is this appropriate? Do I need to do this? Is there another way I can service this project in a better way? Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's not all the answers. It's a very complex problem. And I'm taking a drink because what you're saying is just landing. Again, it's that, like, it's making me tear up. Like, I love what you're saying. It's just beautiful. I don't know why it's making me emotional. It's so weird. (laughs) It's not weird. But I just, I think you're hitting on something just very true. It's like helping each other. It's the acknowledgement of of yourself first and foremost which you need to do with how you're feeling in that moment you know if if you're devastated or whatnot it's important to acknowledge that and not put it aside is what I'm hearing but um then you you know you have to okay well I'm, I'm acknowledging it you can continue acknowledging it while being happy for the other person it's like how can we begin to educate that process how can we begin applying it ourselves? Because it does start with, you know, ourselves doing that. Yeah. But then how can then we spread that that word? And how can we bring in, you know, uh, mentor those more more young females or each other, you know, in, in that sort of way? And I just think it's beautiful. And I don't know why it's landing. So just emotional. It's very surprising. No, it's totally <laughs> so, normal. So, yeah, but. Yeah, those, I think that's a, that's not just a fresh take, but a very um, relevant and appropriate, um, very smart way to, to, to do it, you know, especially with allowing the space for, again, it's just so surprising how emotional it's landing is, and it's just, wow, and very unexpected, I wasn't expecting that, um, but also taking, you know, how can you go and be of service in a different way on set, you know, and allow the space for, you know, the, um, the, the sort of Latin, the story from the Latin perspective, Latino's perspective and, and allow then that, you know, and then how can then that generate, because uh, for me, Right now, I'm just thinking, too, how can we get more diverse females on set, too? A diverse-looking female, not just of 
skin color, but of size. That yeah. that for me is is really important and big right now because I know when I go out, mine for me it's even it's very few, and I have privilege. I recognize I have privilege and might even get cast over, you know, a smaller or depending on on the 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 particular project. But if I'm going up against my white female peers, I'm not. I automatically assume I'm not going to be chosen. Yeah you know, because of my size and, or because of how I look or, you know, coming across as a conservative, there's that immediate, you know, judgment occurring right when they walk in. It's like, let the performance speak mm. before you, before you decide, you know? Yeah. But I just think, wow, how can then you take, we take what you just said and expand it to even more, you know? So I just think that, and I think also, you know, it's definitely the job of the director and the casting director to educate themselves and to maybe question their own prejudices, their own internal biases, because we all have them. I have them, you know, we all have them. And it's accepting that and confronting those internal biases that's going to lead to a more diverse and inclusive environment. And so, you know, we, we as actors or storytellers, we can only really control ourselves, but I gently encourage anyone in a position of, you know, directing or casting to also, you know, look inward at their own internal biases Mm -hmm. and see how, how can we enrich our storytelling with more humanity? Mm -hmm. Because humanity doesn't come in one size, one shape, one color. That's what's so cool about it. Mm -hmm. Very true, very true. At the human level, it's that take it down to the bear. Like Mm. how you you know you described earlier, just being in that very um, authentic and and present, you know, sort of self. Yeah. Type of thing, and I just think, yeah, the practice of that. How how can we begin doing that? And I feel like what you're saying makes me think well then how can women come together more women in those projects and how can we come together those who do the writing then then bring those who do the acting bring the directors and i still feel like there there's there's still a hesitance there 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 might be a desire you yeah. know like me trying to do this podcast i'd love to do more i want to do more with with women in terms of coming together and writing something yeah. I would love to there's there's just story there and I want to write it and I want us to come together and create it and um it doesn't mean it's only with female exclusive and no men but I mean just just more of a just how can we get even more because there's like Findlay Productions and she's you know I, I, I follow her and I think I love you know everything she's creating and how can we get more you know sort of of that yeah. Where it can be embraced and accepted. Yeah. Well, you know? this is kind of totally off the cuff. I was I anyways, I was thinking about this similar thing about like a month or two ago and just really thinking, God, how many great women do we have in this community and how schismed are we or how, you know, separated are we really? Yes. You know, and we, we all, I'm sure for the most part, generally speaking, follow each other and like each other's posts and have a respect for each other. But when's, when's the last time we were all in a room together? Yeah. I don't know, never. And so I was thinking to myself, how cool would it be to have like a collaborative, creative learning experience where you get like, however many women want to come, you like rent a space or a cabin or a retreat area, whatever the the capacity calls for. And each woman brings a session, a workshop of whatever the heck they want to do. Yeah. You know, yes. like for me, it would probably be like script work because I love doing script work. I mm-hmm. think I'm good at it. And I feel like I could help people with that. But maybe, you know, um, someone else is super good at, uh, fight choreography or writing or, 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 you know, other things. And it's like, I just feel like we have so much to learn from each other. And more than that, there's, I would love an opportunity to connect. That's all, you know, this past year has been so lonely, so disconnected. Mm -hmm. And I think we could all just use an opportunity to connect. Yes. But it's like, when's the right time for that? Right. When are people comfortable getting together? You know, it's, so anyways, 
just, oh my gosh, I love that so much. When you say that, it gets me so excited. I, the first thing I think is, um, how can we start this? And when are we going to do it? Mm-hmm. Because I want, I, I, that is exactly, I think, would only just bring the community um, together. And if we can just come to and see, or I mean, come with that open mind and address our own biases or whatever, like, you know, do that internal work and then come that way we can just create that supportive community. Right. I think it could be so powerful. So many great stories can be, can be told, you know, and then I think that it can all come together. Like, again, it does come down to, I think both men and women have to be able to come together and work together. And that's where the true power will be is when we can, we don't have to be separate like that, that it can be completely inclusive, mm. you know, in, in, and it doesn't have to be 50, 50. It's just that minds coming together. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That creative, creative hive mind mm-hmm. that, yeah, I love it. Um, if I would love to continue that conversation, I want to hear more of what you're thinking on that maybe yeah. outside of this. Um, yeah. Cause I just think that's a wonderful idea. Good. I, yeah. I know that I, I couldn't plan it alone, so I need help. And I, I've reached out to two other women in the community and, you know, they, they have some personal stuff right now that is a little hairy. Um, mm-hmm. but I would love to continue the conversation after. Well, I don't have any personal stuff. And the first thing I think is how can I be of service to you? Oh, <laughs> she gets it. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do to, you know, help you and contribute and do all of that? How can I yes. be of service? This is, I love that. I love that. <laughs> service to, you know, each other and, and show up and be there. So, mm. so important. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to continuing that conversation. Heck yes. yes. Me too. Yes. Um, and then, okay. So then that leads in, um, to our sort of let's uh, kind of, um, wrap up with with this beautiful beautiful conversation that I'm just loving today um is then how can we extend that so women coming together and us empowering each other but then how then can we bring in the sort of the men how can we draw them in how can we teach them to teach others to support us how can all of that happen do you think yeah I think that's a really tricky tricky question Because like immediately I just think like, how do we teach anyone anything? Like really, Mm -hmm. in my experience, I have only changed my perspective when I wanted to and when I was ready to. And maybe sometimes that takes years. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would love to have a really easy answer to how do we you know, have men view us as equals and teach them to, you know, be allies. Um, but I just, I don't, I don't know that that's our job. Mm. Like as women, I don't think it's our responsibility to teach men to view us as equals or to treat us with respect. I think that is, their responsibility because really at the end of the day the only thing I have control over is myself Mm -hmm. and so what I can choose to do is show up authentically show up present and show up wholeheartedly and if someone chooses to respect that or not that's on them that's a reflection of who they are not a reflection of who I am and in my experience I'm super selective with my inner circle I have a very small amount of close people in my life and I choose to keep them there because they respect me and they fulfill my life and they bring me joy Mm -hmm. and, and we can challenge each other and grow together. And so I guess if there's someone in my life, because there have been, that doesn't, that don't respect me, especially because of something so trivial as my gender or my sexual orientation or whatever it might be, they get the ax. They are no longer allowed to have contact with my energy, yeah. whether it's a job or a family member or an acquaintance. I am not willing to sacrifice my peace of mind for anyone. So if you're in my life, it's because you're awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yes. That is the perfect way to, to just like 
The end. It's just like, <laughs> awesome. I'm like, that cannot be top. Mic oh, drop. Yep, mic drop. <laughs> I'm going to get that sound effect, right? When you say mic drop, I'm going to start that in, like, and do, a, do like, the visual. I'm going to get a little fancy with this animation in this particular yeah. video. And... <laughs> See, and you even gave that perfect, so now I know exactly where to put it. I don't have to sit and start. See, See how you're totally helping me be able to... <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Oh, my gosh. I love that. Oh. This has been so amazing and beautiful and you made me cry and this is just, uh, just feed the soul, uh, you know, session and, and post- podcast episodes. So I'm so grateful that you came today, Zoe. Thank you so much for being part of this and being on this journey too and sharing your story and being vulnerable. I so appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.